come now to the 16th study presentation here at the 1984 British Columbian Camp Meeting. This is the Monday evening 7.30 service on the 27th of August 1984. We'll now continue our study of the prophetic um, predictions pointing to the rise of this movement at this time with this very message. I'd like to now uh, examine a point I made at the beginning I said that it was, it was not satisfactory to simply pluck an odd statement from here and there and put them together to build a case supporting separation. What we needed was a series of outline prophecies with specific and identifiable starting points followed by clearly uh, identified waymarks along the way and then at a given point there we would see in clear terms the dividing of the pathway one group going one direction, the other in another. In other words, there would be the rising of the new movement. And I said too that uh, it would not be sufficient to find one such prophetic outline. We need at least two, and preferably three, at least. Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every truth is to be established. Now have we satisfied those exacting demands in these presentations? Have we, for instance, found a series of, of at least three, in fact we've found five haven't we so far, in which there is a very clear and identifiable starting point. Have we found that? Right. And have we found that subsequently there was a sequence of um, readily definable um, uh, events following on past that point? And in turn, have we seen the new movement clearly predicted in the prophecies themselves? I think that we've met those exacting demands and therefore can be satisfied that we have arrived at safe and reliable truth. I'd like to just mention again in more detail now the um, point in regard to God's battle plan. We are students of the Sabbath rest message and uh, around the world this message of course is very deeply loved or intensely hated one or the other, which I like to hear. I, I really appreciate a situation where, where people are all in or all out, not a situation where we have this kind of shaky, uncertain, unclear, grey areas where people are neither one thing nor the other. In the Sabbath rest message we have learned that the only thing to consider is what is God's command and what are his promises. We are not to start reasoning and, and using logic to figure out um, the way in which the work of God should be done. Rather we only ask one question, what does God say about how it should be done? And if God says it, what then? We do it. I think we have a statement in Christ Topic Lessons, page 363. I'd like to read at this point in regard to the Sabbath rest presentation and also in regard to the plan we have on the board before us today. 363, unless I'm mistaken, in the little book Christ Object Lessons. Yes, this is the statement. <clears throat> it says... When we give ourselves wholly to God and in our work follow his directions, he makes himself responsible for its accomplishment. He would not have us conjecture as to the success of our honest endeavours. Not once should we even think of failure. We are to cooperate with one who knows no failure. Now, let's go back over the statement in relationship to the diagram still on the board this, this evening. When we give ourselves wholly to God, anybody who accepts the message of 1888, as we did back there in 1915, has committed himself to a pathway, has committed himself to follow wholly where God leads the way. It's not just a matter of accepting the message and sitting back and enjoying it. There is a progression of events which follow through. And so we follow God as he leads us out in separation takes away the foolish virgins and puts us through a training period of preparation for a work of critical magnitude and importance in the very near future. So when we give ourselves wholly to God, as the statement says, and in our work follow his directions. Now here's the critical element. We are to follow his directions. And these prophecies are uh, roadmaps, as you might say. They are guidelines. They are... They are the revelation to us of God's directions to the kingdom all the way through 
Now when we follow his directions, he makes himself responsible for its accomplishment. Now this infers that when we do not follow his directions, when we start to theorize and uh, use logic and human reasoning and say, well, it's all very well for you to put this map on the board tonight, but um, I don't see things quite that way. In my opinion, in order for me to win those precious souls in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I've got to stay amongst those people in order to bring the message to them. Now that's human reasoning. Here we have God's directions versus human reasoning. Now, if we adopt human reasoning and stay in the church to save the souls there as we believe we should do, then who now becomes responsible for the success of the work? We do. We do. And what hope do we have of being successful? None whatsoever. Now, because I'm not overlooking the important point that sometimes uh, when the message first comes to you for a short period of time, and really for a short period of time, God may keep you in the church in order to enable you to give a witness there which you could not, which, which must have given before you leave. I found back in the early days, of course, I stayed in the church for something like, um, was it 1955 to 62, seven years, well, not, no, until 1961, for about six years. But of course, back in those days, things were rather different from what they are at the present time. The church had not yet, at that time, pronounced the message for the second time. Some folk find that they don't, they don't stay in the church very long, others can stay a little longer. Maybe we shouldn't stay there at all, that depends upon God's personal direction. But generally speaking, of course, eventually God brings us out and puts us into school out here in separation. Now think about it. Um, whenever God decides to do a great work, he calls a people, usually first of all individuals such as John the Baptist, Elijah, Moses and so forth, and you cannot name a single person whom God called to do a great work and we're all called to do the greatest work of all time in the, in the very near future you can't name one person in the past whom God called, whom God did not first separate from the organizations of their day take for instance uh, John the Baptist where did he spend the first 30 years of his life? in, in the schools of the rabbis? out in the desert in the desert Consider Christ himself in the obscure little village of Nazareth not attending the schools of the rabbis either but being educated by his mother as his human teacher and God as his divine teacher. Think of Moses who was separated from Egypt for 40 years out in the deserts of Midian. Think of Paul who went away after his conversion for three years into the desert to study and uh, spend time alone with God. Think of William Miller likewise studying alone in separation from other church influences, not even reading the books of other churches but using his concordance and Bible alone. Now, John the Baptist of course is a very clear type of the people of God in these last days and as surely as God separated him and put him into a school free from the tainting influences of false religion, so surely will God put us into school today free from the tainting influence of false religion. Now let's look at this matter of separation from the practical point of view. Supposing that we all decide to remain in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, supposing that was God's plan, then how could the message ever be conveyed to hungering souls around the earth? If you're in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, then you must be loyal to the organization. You must support it with your finances, your tithe and offerings must go to the church. You cannot entertain a different message to which the church is hostile if you're in that church you must be in it you can't be you can't be something different from what it is and at the same time be in it and at the same time be consistent and honest so then if then all our money for instance was going into the treasury of the church how could we print the message in books how could we travel and preach the message and so forth and if furthermore I was a member of that Seventh day Adventist church then how could I against their wishes and principles travel the world and preach a message which is contrary to their principle? You can't do it and be consistent. And therefore, from from every point of view, separation from the church becomes a a necessity, a practical necessity and an urgent necessity for those who will go through the schooling and must be prepared to give that final warning in the end. Now, I know that... um, as we think of loved ones in the church, as we think of earnest, honest souls in the church, we say, I, I've, I've got a burden for those souls, I must go and, 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 and work for them. Leave that for God to worry about. 
Your task is to obey orders. And remember that uh, when we studied the life of Jesus Christ, and he was about to make his final journey from Galilee down to Jerusalem to die on the cross, God said to him, Go to Jerusalem when? Now. Satan said, But don't do that today. Look at all the millions of perishing souls out there that are hungering for the words of life, the sick and need your healing, your, the touch of your healing power. Go and look after them first and then later go to the cross. If you want the reference for that, it's found on page 489 or thereabouts, I'll get it here in just a second, where um, in Desire of Ages, Sister White paints this picture. It's on page 486 in the book Desire of Ages. I read it before, so I shan't read it again this evening. But Satan's argument was, don't go to the cross now, leave that till later, don't bypass all these perishing souls, they need your ministry, go to them now and die at a more convenient time. But Jesus Christ had to set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, he had to leave those perishing souls in God's care while he went down to be crucified in Calvary's cross. <clears throat> And when one studies the first 30 years of Christ's life, an area of very, very pressing interest in our minds today because of the child salvation message, we realise that uh, during those first 30 years, Christ did carry a very heavy burden for the perishing souls around about him. And he could very easily have instituted or inaugurated a, a very busy missionary programme working for all the perishing souls out there in the world. But he didn't do it. Why not? Because it wasn't his time. And uh, he, waited, he waited until the day came that he heard the news from the Jordan River. He knew his time had come. He left the carpenter shop and he went out to begin his life work. And all this reminds me of two men who uh, w were faced with the task. Each had, each had to produce a certain amount of fallen lumber or timber, in, fallen trees in, in, in a certain space of time. And they, both, they each had a chainsaw, and both chainsaws were, were, were blunt because of previous usage. One man, feeling the tremendous urgency of his task, ran out quickly with his chainsaw and started to cut down trees with a blunt chainsaw. Naturally, naturally, he had the first two or, three, two or three trees down before the other man, who sat for a while sharpening his saw, got started. But very soon, who had the most work done? And the answer, of course, becomes very obvious. And so God wants and must have for the final conflict sharp instruments, polished instruments to carry his work through. So I present to you from the word of God, God's plan of battle, which reveals where God wants you to be in separation in school, being prepared for the, for the conflict which is soon to come upon the unsuspecting heads of this old world. Now I want now to turn to the parable of the net, which is uh, outlined for us very nicely in the book Christ Object Lessons. I believe the scripture reference is page 1, I mean Matthew chapter 13 if I remember correctly. Um, yes, Matthew chapter 13 verses 47 to 50. Let's turn to those scripture verses and um, we'll note again the procedures to be followed in the separation work before the close of probationary time. <laughs> Now I mention this because uh, once again there are arguments, people argue and say well the separation will take place at the end when the great final test is brought and there will be a separation at, at that point of time but it's not the only one. And we need to meet this argument and meet it very clearly and well from the word of God. Now the people who, are, who, who mention the great final shaking as if it were the only one thereby argue that we should remain in the church until that great separation takes place. And they believe it will be at the time of the, of the image of the beast. So Matthew chapter 13 verses 47 to 50 reads as, follow, reads as follows. Again, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, <clears throat> which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. So at the end of the world is to be the separation between the wicked and the just, as this text says. Now 
Now in the book Christ Object Lessons we have um, some very clear comments which, which cover only two pages, one, two, two and one, two, three of the book. That's all the comment on this parable. And after quoting the verses we have just read, it then goes on to say, the casting of the net is the preaching of the gospel. This gathers both good and evil into the church. Now the Bible text does not tell us whether the net is cast from a boat or from the shore. I'm going to take the liberty then of drawing a ship tonight offshore out on the deep especially pickled because so far as the apostles were concerned they seemed to always fish from a boat on the Sea of Galilee so I rather think that we shan't be too far out in using an offshore fishing expedition just as those apostles did back in the days of Jesus Christ so we'll now proceed to make a little sketch of a ship out of sea casting its net into the water to gather the fish from the sea below these are the very regular waves on this particular lake here is the boat, here is the sail, and here is the net which goes over the side. Now as Sister White says, the casting church, so in this net we have good and evil, and the ship therefore must be the symbol of the church. The ship, they often say, is going through, and it's quite a standard procedure to describe the church as being the ship, isn't it? That's quite standard. Now, going a little further, then says, oh, first of all, I should make the point, here we have a separation of good and evil from good and evil, because does one net will bring every fish out of the sea? No, it doesn't. The sea is not empty to fish. So down here then on the, um, the bottom of the sea, we've got uh, good and bad fish of all shapes and sizes. So let's put the words good and bad are left there in the sea. Now the net dips again and again and again, each time bringing more good and more evil from the sea into, into the ship. Now what are some other terms used in the Bible? Let's, let's have two other sets of terms used in the Bible to describe the good and evil fish. We say good and evil fish and wheat and tares and wise and foolish virgins. Very, very good. <coughs> And just as we mentioned that um, there are three classes involved, so we have the same picture here. There's a good and evil brought in, and there's a good and evil left in the sea till, till later harvesting, but there's also the evil which never goes in the net at all, because never at any time does a fisherman gather all the fish from the sea. Now we read on in the same uh, statement, the next words say, when the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. Christ saw how the existence of false brethren in the church would cause the way of truth to be evil spoken of. The world would revile the gospel because of the inconsistent lives of false professors. Even Christians would, could, would be caused to stumble as they saw that many who bore Christ's name were not controlled by his spirit. Because these sinners were in the church, men would be in danger of thinking that God excused their sins. Therefore Christ lifts the veil from the future and bids all to behold that it is character, not position, which decides man's destiny. Both the parable of the tares and that of the net plainly teach that there is no time when all the wicked will turn to God. The wheat and the tares go together till the harvest. <coughs> the good and the bad fish are, drawn, are together drawn ashore for a final separation. Now let's complete the picture. When the mission of the gospel is completed, the statement says, Now, when will the mission of the gospel at last be completed? At the end of the loud cry, and therefore the end of the latter rain. And then comes the judgment. As the statement says, when the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. So eventually, the fisherman with a, with a boatload of fish goes to the shore. Here, shall we say, is the shore. Put a palm tree or two over the side, and look nice and tropical. And the fisherman then sits down upon the shore, shall, well, or stands if he likes, whatever way. We'll draw him here with a basket in between his knees. And he picks up each fish, examines it, and judges whether that fish is a good fish or a bad fish. If he finds a jellyfish or an octopus or 
some, some of those useless uh, kind of fish, what's he do? He throws it back into the sea from whence it came. So the bad fish go back to the sea, but what about the good fish? They go into the harvest, right? Now, this means that there are two different separations uh, caused by two different um, factors, and we'll now compare these two separations. The first separation is caused by the preaching of the gospel, because the net is the gospel. The second is caused by an examination, and a judgment made upon the basis of the examination. The first separation separates good and evil from the rest in the sea, while the second separation divides the good from the evil that were previously taken from the sea. In other words, any good fish that's left in the sea has no part in the separation up here because to get into that separation you've got to go to the ship, don't you? You must be caught, put in the ship, taken to shore to participate in this next separation. So if you're a good fish and decide to stay in the sea and, and not get into the, the true gospel ship, but stay in the sea until the judgment comes, you won't be part of that second separation and therefore you won't be part of the kingdom. Now if you're part of the first separation, you have a chance for the second but not a guarantee, whereas if you're not in the first separation, you certainly will have no part in the second separation. Now, if we recall the diagram we had here previously, that is this afternoon, you remember that first of all we had the companies bound together by cords, with the two classes in the companies, then came the gospel light, and when the first angel's message sounded in 1833 and again in 1850, that was the dipping of the net, the gospel net, into the sea. Now the sea is the world, isn't it? But it also, uh, and therefore, a worldly church, an apostate church, becomes the sea, right? Is that clear? Sure. It, it, it definitely is the, uh, it is the sea. And as we saw, that gospel net produced a separation which brought out both wise and foolish, or put good and evil fish into the ship. And then came a test. When that test came, what did the dudes of the wise and the foolish? It separated the wise from the foolish. That is, the wise from the foolish who had been previously separated from the sea. And of course, when we come down to the loud cry period, we have the same thing repeated. Here's the midnight cry. Here, once again, is the apostate churches, which, which now, of course, includes Roman Catholic, Protestant, and so forth. And once again, the gospel net will dip into that sea. It'll bring out wise and foolish virgins, good and bad fish, wheat and tares, and they'll continue there until they come to the great final test of the judgment and then we'll find that the, that the final separation will take place. As the statement says, when the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. Now it's critically important that we recognise the difference between these two separations. If we don't, we're in trouble. Now, we've learned, of course, that in the Bible there are quite often two things called by the same name but they're different and we must understand those differences. Two justifications, two comings of Christ, two laws, and so forth and so on. And here, of course, we have two distinct, uh, two distinct separations which are different from each other, um, caused by, in, the, in, in one, the preaching of the gospel, in the second, of course, by the, by the great final test. Now, once you have got these two separations clear in your mind, and whenever you read a statement in the spirit of prophecy in regard to separations, you should be able to identify which of the two is involved. Now, for instance, one statement which goes something like this, it says it is angels and not men who accomplish the work of separation. Which separation would you give that one to? First or the second? Second, second right. Not the first, but the second. It is the preaching of the gospel which causes the separation. Which separation? The first one, right? And you should have no difficulty in recognising which is which. Now, for instance, in the book Early Writings, we read this afternoon about the, um, the shaking that Sister White saw and described in the early part of the chapter. And Sister White said, I asked the meaning or the cause of the shaking I had seen and was shown it would be caused by the, by the true witness to lay the sins, which is the gospel. So that shaking was caused by the preaching of the later sin message. So which shaking was it, the first or the second? The first, very clearly. And so once you've got that principle in mind, you should have no difficulty at all in recognising which shaking is being referred to. And then you'll be very much on safe ground, of course. 
Now let's um, examine one more outline prophecy, and this is a very simple and easy one to follow. Um, it is the fact that uh, the work of God is not completed by three angels, or four, but by seven. We're now familiar with the study, of course, or should be. It's coming out in the Messenger magazine month by month, and it's available on tape recording, certainly, and I hope by this time next year to have it in book form in your hands. Now, <clears throat> let's turn to Revelation chapter 14 for a moment. And we wish to make some rather important comparisons between the rise of each successive movement. And um, this, this, of course, um, quite clearly uh, answers the point that the third angel is the one to go through, which when it isn't, the seven, there are seven angels required to finish the work. Now in verse Revelation 14 verse 6 it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, <clears throat> the first angel himself did not personally preach the message. These angels are symbols of, of earthly agencies through whom the message is preached. And therefore the angel, the first angel, symbolised the first angel's movement. Now I think that none of us would argue with that under any circumstances. Now this meant then the following points in regards to the first angel's movement. First of all, it uh, was, uh, it had new, a new, or new leaders in other words, those who were leaders at that time in the established churches were not the leaders in the Great Second Advent Movement. Isn't that correct? That's the first point. Point number two, they had new truth. New truth which had not been preached before. Never before in human history had they preached the hour of God's judgment is come. Okay? Number three, it caused a separation as the wise and the foolish virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. Caused a separation, and let me think of some more points now in regard to this. Uh, the, I'll think of more as we go on. Those are the, those are the first three main points. Um, and of course we, we, we should say, of course, that, that they were persecuted by the existing churches. Now, when the second angel's movement arose in 1844, the second angel being, of course, the message that Babylon the Great has fallen, is fallen, not ba but just Babylon, not Babylon the Great. The leaders of the first angel's movement uh, were not the leaders in the second angel's movement. I think I should put here a uh, new leaders, and maybe this should be in the first point, a definite movement of people was involved. And movement means, movement means something going somewhere, right? You can hardly call, well I suppose you can call it the present Seventh-day Adventist Church a movement because it's moving downhill, it's moving in the wrong direction. But a movement is, is moving somewhere, it's going either up or down. And when the second angel appeared, another movement was formed. We call it the second angel's movement and quite rightly so. And those who were leaders in the first angel's movement, namely Miller and Himes and those men were not the leaders in the second. Fetch and Litch led out in the second, later joined by Samuel Snow in the midnight cry phase of the second angel's message. Did they have new truth not taught before? They did. did uh, was there a separation when the second angel's message came? Absolutely. Not all those, not all those in the first angel's movement went on to be members of the second angel's movement, although, although they should have. It wasn't God's plan that such a separation should take place, but it did. Unfortunately, uh, it, was, it, was, it was unfortunately necessary. Now, the same, the same thing is true as the third angel appeared. He likewise became the symbol of a movement of people. And once again, we have new leaders. <clears throat> Miller... Himes, Fetch, Litz and Snow were not leaders in the third angel's movement. Instead we find that um, men like Joseph Bates, Loughborough, 
James Nolan White and those folk became the leaders of the next phase in the work. Did this once again cause a mighty separation to take place? Of the 50,000 folk who came out, only a few dozen survived that awesome test when that time came. And they had wonderful new truths in regard to the sanctuary, the state of the dead, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the investigative judgment, the Sabbath truth, health reform, dress reform, true Christian education, and so on and on and on. Now, the third angel is not the last. We've learnt that uh, in the seven angels presentation. We're well aware that we are the only movement in history which has been able to see beyond ourselves and to recognise that we are only a, a unit in the complete chain of events that bring us right down to the end of time. Now when this fourth angel's movement arises and it, and it, it has arisen because we're now in the, uh, the opening phases of the fourth angel's movement Sister White plainly describes this as a movement Let me turn to Great Controversy a wonderful chapter called The Final Warning and on page 604 I read these words Of Babylon at the time brought to view in this prophecy, it is declared, her sins have reached to heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. She has filled up the measure of her guilt and destruction is about to fall upon her. But God still has a people in Babylon and before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. And that, that, those words are too plain to be misread. It says, hence the movement. Now, which movement? The one symbolized by the first angel? No. By the second? No. The third? Again, no. But that angel which comes down from heaven, lightens the earth with his glory and cries mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. Now, which angel is that? The fourth. No question about it. It's the fourth angel or the revelation. And that angel symbolizes a movement just like all the angels who went before. And um, when, when the time came, because it has come for the Laodicean message to be proclaimed, which is the fourth angel's message, which is the third angel's message in verity, then was fulfilled the words found in Testimonies, Volume 5, where Sister White warned the people of God that new leadership would be involved in this final work. Let's turn to page 1881 in the book uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, where this point is very, very clearly made. The days are fast approaching when there will be great perplexity and confusion. And no longer are those days approaching, are they? They're here, very much here. There is today great perplexity and confusion, which I know, of course, will get much worse yet. In fact, we no longer say things will get worse before they get better. We now say and, uh, things will get worse before they get still worse. Satan, clothed in angel robes, will deceive if possible the very elect. There will be God's many and Lord's many. Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. Those who have rendered supreme homage to science falsely so-called will not be the leaders then. Those who trusted to intellect, genius or talent will not then stand at the head of rank and file. They did not keep pace with the light. Those who proved themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. They're self-sufficient, independent of God, and he cannot use them. The Lord is faithful servants who in the shaking testing time will be disclosed to view. There are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. They have not had the light which has been shining in a concentrated blaze upon you. But it may be under a rough and un uninviting exterior that the, the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. In the daytime we look toward heaven but do not see the stars. They are there, fixed in the firmament, but the eye cannot distinguish them. In the night we behold their genuine luster. Those are before the days of air pollution. Page 1881 of uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. And come back now, the paragraph first of all warns us that, that the days would come when there be great perplexity and confusion on every hand. It then says, 
When that time comes, there'll be new leadership. Those who have rendered supreme homage to science, falsely so-called, will not be the leaders then. Those who are trusted to intellect, genius or talent will not then stand at the head of rank and file. Now the inference is, of course, that they will not then do it, but they were doing it up until that point of time. Now we should recognise, of course, that uh, in all the modern churches of today, a person doesn't become a minister or a leader of any kind unless he goes through a very strenuous course of training and gets a degree of some sort or the other which supposedly qualifies, qualifies him for his position. And that is, that is trust to intellect because any intellectual person can get those degrees. In this movement, of course, we're not concerned with intellect, we're concerned with a spiritual experience. Reading on, it says, They did not keep pace with the lights. Ask yourself, for instance, um, how much of the glorious truths that we understand today on the Sabbath rest, on the Battle of Armageddon, on uh, God's character, on God is my doctor, on the Philadelphian Church, and the Laodicean Church is understood by the ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's very, very little. Their ignorance, ignorance is quite astonishing in, in these fields. And therefore they certainly have not kept pace with the light. Those who prove themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. Now, which angel's movement is involved in the, in the last solemn work? The fourth angel, the Revelation chapter 18 angel. And in that movement, we're plainly told that there will be, and in fact there is new leadership, and there will be other leaders too that God will appoint as time goes by. So we have definite statements to tell us in the spirit of prophecy that the fourth angel does symbolise a movement and secondly when that movement, as that movement develops uh, the leaders in it will not be the leaders back in the third angel's movement as it is now constituted. So the pattern moves on. Now let's suppose the fourth angel of course brings a great deal of light beyond that brought by the third angel. It's the same message but it's much broader much deeper, much more beautiful, much more comprehensive. Now, we know today, of course, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has lost the third angel's message. They lost it back in 1859 and never recovered it. All they've got is an empty shell, uh, a series of theoretical doctrines and uh, teaching, but they don't have the living truth as it is in Jesus. But now, let's suppose, though, that... Um, and this is, a, this is a, a hypothetical proposition which could not be actually true in fact. But let us suppose that the Seventh-day Adventist Church today had never lost the third angel's message, but at the same time they refused to accept the fourth. That's an impossibility. Because if they had faithfully kept the third, what would they naturally do? They would naturally accept the fourth. But if they dug their toes in and said, no, we're content with, with the third and don't want the fourth, what would still be my responsibility? to stay back with them and with, with the third or to move on with the unfolding light to move on right but of course th th that would make a more difficult choice than we now have although I wouldn't find I don't think I'd find it too difficult myself but in as much as they have lost the third altogether excepting for the theory of truth then it makes our decision much simpler and for my part I want to keep pace with the advancing light I don't want to be one hour behind the unfolding of truth so my preparation of the coming conflict can be thoroughly developed and I can be made fully ready to meet that time when it does come. Now in turn, the fourth angel is not the last. The fifth, sixth and seventh follow him. And we have concrete evidence in the words of the little flock that the fifth angel does in fact symbolise a movement of people. Let me remind you of that from this little publication. In Revelation chapter 14, for instance, and verse uh, 15, it says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat upon the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, there an angel, the fifth angel, speaks. And in the little book of words, the little flock, Sister White definitely equates that angel as being a movement of people and here are the words it says um, page 12 
Then Jesus will have this sharp sickle in his hand, Revelation 14 verse 14, and then the saints will cry day and night to Jesus on the cloud to thrust in his sharp sickle and reap. Now the Bible says the angel cries day and night, thrust in your sickle and reap. Sister Wise says the saints cry day and night, thrust in your sickle and reap. So then, very obviously, once again, the angels symbolise a company of people who at this time will be the 144,000, who in turn will become the Sixth Angels Movement, without loss of membership. This is when the pattern changes, of course. Those who come, um, those who become the Fifth Angels Movement and go on to become the Sixth Angels Movement, there's a break in the pattern in that there will be no earthly messengers or leaders at that time, no more message to be presented. And secondly, there will be no loss of membership from the, from the transition between the one and the other, that having been, because all those who come to the fifth will be faithful right through to the sixth, none will be falling out during that period of time. So then, inasmuch as there are seven movements of people uh, through whom the work will be finished, and inasmuch as each of the first four movements are marked by new leaders, a separation from the, from the previous movement, uh, new truths, and um, those are the main points, then we must expect with the advent of the fourth angel that there will be a new movement with new truths, new leaders, and separation from the old church. The pattern is there and it can't be broken. Now this concludes, I think, as best I remember now, the actual prophetic outlines I wish to present to you of the development of the, of the um, Laodicean Church and the Laodicean, and, and the Laodicean message to correct the Laodicean condition. And now tomorrow morning, according to request, I'm going to start giving you a fairly detailed and comprehensive history of the movement from the very beginnings of it, the great crisis we have been through, the victories gained, the personalities involved, I think you'll find this an extremely interesting history. If you get bored halfway through, tell me and I'll stop. But right now, the time has gone, so we'll stop tonight and we'll pick up the thread again tomorrow morning. Any questions you'd like to ask before we close out the study?